Hello and good morning. Welcome. My name is Peter Greenberger, and I am The Hill's publisher. I am delighted to welcome all of you here today to our discussion on America's opioid epidemic, lessons learned and a way forward. I'm especially excited to welcome a special guest. My mother is here. It shows what a small town this is. <laughs> Over the past few years, The Hill has spent a considerable amount of time bringing to life conversations surrounding the opioid crisis. We have attempted to shine a light on the efforts to halt the march of this epidemic, and today our focus is on the role of treatment as a pathway to recovery. Academics and researchers tell us that the safest and most effective form of, rec of recovery requires a combination of medical and behavioral therapy. Yet only 20% of those battling opioid addiction are getting the treatment they need. We are going to take a look at legislation passed by Congress to fight the epidemic and ask what other policy solutions can ensure the health and well-being of our communities that are most directly impacted by this crisis. This morning, we will hear from the nation's leading policymakers, medical professionals, researchers, and patient advocates. But first, a few quick housekeeping notes. In addition to our audience here in the room, we're also live streaming on thehill.com. Please keep your phones on silent throughout the duration of the program, but we do encourage you to join the conversation on social media. You can follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, on LinkedIn, at The Hill Events, and we will be using the hashtag The Hill Opioids. Finally, for those of you here in the room, you will receive an electronic survey following the event. We love your feedback. We love your input. Please tell us how we can do better. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Nora Volkoff, Director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse for the first conversation of the program. She is joined by The Hill's editor-at-large, Mr. Steve Clemens. Steve. Thank you very much, Peter. Good morning, everybody. Nora, great to meet you. So I'm going to ask you, Nora, do you think Peter Greenberger's mother is here because of him or in spite of him? He's here because of him. And where is the mother? <laughs> no, she's great. Um, good to be with all of you. And Nora, thanks so much for joining us. We've got um, some time here. We've got an audience of people out on the front uh, lines. I just met BK McDonough, who's uh, in treatment centers out in the field. We have experts in science. Uh, and we have folks that are lay people. And I just want to have you give us a snapshot of what we as a society don't know about the science that you do and that you see that would be helpful us for, to understand the science of opioid, uh, the op opioid ec epidemic and how to respond to it. Well, I, I, like anything else in, in science, I mean, there's, there's so, we always, I think, have a problem in communicating the knowledge that we have in ways that are meaningful to to the public in general. And I think that in the case of addiction, that's not very different. So we have been uh, based on the science saying addiction is a disease, but we have failed to actually explain uh, why is it a disease and how do our understanding of the changes in the brain that lead a person to lose control over drug intake ultimately help us understand why they do what they do while at the same time putting this into the context of the social environmental factors that enable it to happen. So we tend to take from the perspective of science these very simplistic views or, oh, it is a disease because my brain is not working. Mm. But then how do I then link that with the fact that social factors are so important without mm. recognizing that there is a continuum? So if I were to choose one aspect about what is that we have failed in communicating, is how important the environment, and in particular the social environment, is for our well-being. And how when we don't have that, when we isolate ourselves, when we don't have a mission of purpose, when we don't feel that people care for us, that makes us very vulnerable to taking drugs. And in turn, those drugs affect the brain in ways that can lead us towards the path of addiction. And I think that that ability to explain how sensitive we are to our environments, to our context, is something that we have not properly described. I think part of described. the story, you know, it's shocking. I, I guess in 2017, maybe maybe more since, there were 70,000 deaths, and I had not realized that the um, that the prevalence, that the death rate was so high. And so I've gotten to know a, um, a county that's a stressed county in West Virginia, McDowell County, West Virginia. 
uh, has very, very high degree of um, opioid uh, dependency and uh, opioid f fatalities. It is a socioeconomically stressed place. There are problems and just in about every corner of McDowell County. And what you run into are, are issues of sort of moral judgment. Uh, issues of this being, you know, people that are that are desperate and lost in their lives, or who are ignorant. There are all these other sort of social condemnation factors that have come with the way, in my view, McDowell County has been demeaned. What do you think we need to understand to get beyond that? Because there's a, there's an element here where those people who are suffering from this disease are being judged um, and tainted. Yeah, and and we were having <clears throat> this discussion just before because. It's not that uh, the society is um, discriminating them and stigmatizing them. They incorporate that into themselves. So people, when they become addicted, uh, basically lose a sense of value and, uh, and believe in them. And that then leads them to isolate themselves. And probably the worst thing that can happen to someone, to any one of us humans, is to isolate. The isolation is probably extraordinary, aversive, very negative for the brain. So understanding that that way of stigmatizing people in a community is harmful because to start with, it's going to be making them vulnerable to addiction as well as other mental illnesses, including suicide and, 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 and more, I mean, morbid obesity. There are factors that are contributing to people to try to escape. But also on the other side, once you become addicted and you, you, go, you want to stop taking the drugs, you go to treatment, and you're isolated, your likelihood of relapse is mm -hmm. very high. So in order to achieve recovery, we need to bring in social structures that will provide a support for that person. And, and again, it's, it, because it's, it's, people like simple answers and simple solutions. And so we say, OK, yes, medicines for opioid use disorders are very effective. Actually, they are the most effective medications we have for the treatment of addiction and equivalent to medications for other diseases. But we cannot expect a miracle. So if you have become addicted and you have, as a process of addiction, eroded your capacity to actually interact with others, it has, by repeated use of the drug, it has damaged certain aspects of the function of your brain. You cannot expect the mm. medication to do the miracle. You have to see the medication in con conjunction with an intervention that is targeting the needs of that person. How do you do the science of that? Because what I've read, you, uh, you've you written about the medically assisted therapies, which you're an advocate of, need society, they need family support. And a lot of places where the prevalence of this challenge is biggest is those are the exact parts that are falling apart. So I, I'm interested, again, as a scientist, because there's just to be you know shrewdly uh, real about this, are there ways of you know changing those dimensions, or are those you know soft and fuzzy parts of the equation that are that are you know being invented there to kind of create excuses for not getting better. I don't think that they are soft and smushy parts of the equation. They are integral parts of the equation. They are more complex mm. because I mean the moment that you have go beyond one person, the patient that is mm. addicted to a social system where that person is, you have the interactions of many people, and that of course enhances the complexity. And you are pointing your finger exactly at one of the big challenges, and that is. The person that's addicted many times doesn't have that support. Mm. And it doesn't even have the support of a family. I mean, many, many families, it's the disease, the only disease where you see uh, a parent reject the child, where you can hear, I'd rather see my son or daughter dead mm. than addicted. So it, is, it, it can take people to the extreme. And, and so how do you provide that support that's so needed for that person to recover? I says, is it insurmountable? And I said, absolutely not. We have social systems that you can create to buffer for those deficits. And that is, to me, an aspect in terms of when you're saying, as a research, as a scientist, what you would like to do. And the concept is, how do you evaluate the model, social models that can provide that support that the person needs? And, it, and one of the examples that we've known from many studies in the past that faith communities, for example, uh, can be very protective against mm. taking drugs. And what does a faith community do? It gives you the sense of belonging. Mm. And so if you are not religious, there may be other communities that there's no reason why not, cannot mm. give you that sense of belonging. And, and, and this is a message that I think is very, very important for us as a country to recognize that we are a community that if we do not provide that support, 
is going to come back and bite us because it's not just about the addiction to opioids. Now we're seeing the rise in the addiction to stimulant drugs. Mm -hmm. So we need to tackle the problem about what is it making us so vulnerable. And at the essence of that is, yes, drugs are very powerful. They change your brain. They can lead you to these compulsive behaviors. But what is making us vulnerable is like an infection. What is making you vulnerable to an infection? If your immune system is down, you're much more likely to get infected, even with the same virus. Uh, you know, I, I was reading about your, your past not so long ago, but, but you know, nonetheless your past, where one of the things that you put on the, uh, the docket was the dangers of cocaine, and that you spent years and years and years trying to convince colleagues of the dangers of cocaine. You succeeded in that, but it just, it's remarkable to those of us looking back that you had to do that, that there was actually any question in this. And so I'm interested as you look at today at the science establishment, what are their biggest blind spots when it comes to the opioid issue? What are they getting wrong that you feel like you have insights that you need to convince them or move them or show the science that, that you see uh, an incalcitrant scientific community or policy community? I think that you already are guiding my thinking. I mean, recalcitrant, uh, inflexible community in many ways, because we tend to actually polarize almost any argument. Mm. So with opioids, it has happened to one point that when, when I was a medical student, we knew that opioids were very addictive. And as a result of that, we were very reticent to provide opioids to a patient. I had a patient that has mm. complete burn. The only thing that wasn't burned was his foot, because he had a shoe like mine. Mm. And the physician did not want to administer morphine. And I says, well, I, I recall saying to the, the I, was, I was a student, I says, well, the patient is going to die. Because, I mean, at that level of burn, I was in a, in, in, in a very rural community. There were no support. Mm. And he says, it's God who determines who this doesn't die. And morphine is addictive. And I, I recall how bad it hit me, because it is the notion of not being able to see that in certain instances, something that in others can be harmful, can be life-saving, and can pro that can bring some decrease in the suffering. So in the opioid world, we have gone from this very draconian, no, you don't touch it, to what happened at the beginning of the 2000s, where we knew better. And people say, don't worry, it's not addictive if you have pain. That's what we were taught. It's not addictive if you have pain, and don't worry. You will not overdose if you give high doses because you are tolerant. And then we started to see that people with pain became addicted, mm -hmm. and people were overdosing that had been on this pain medication. So it is, again, the distortion that we generate and that we have, and we allow ourselves as thinking creatures to accept dogma that we knew it's incorrect, because it's comfortable. And the moment that you are surrounded by people that believe what you want, and, and it's also, as a physician, it's a great sense of relief to be able to help someone. And if you've ever been given an opioid, you'll realize how extraordinary they are as analgesics. If you have intense pain, mm -hmm. it's gone. And so, mm -hmm. so you can understand why certain physicians would want to embrace that knowledge. Uh, and, and, and then you re reject what you already know, because it's in dissonance. And I think that, um, and, and now we're seeing it again. And you see patients complaining that all of a sudden they cannot get physicians that are willing to give them prescribing opioids when they need them. They are not seeking them out because of their rewarding effects. There's nothing else that helps their pain. And so, but we become again inflexible. And that is part of the problem that I said, that, that would be the message, that we need to recognize that biology, that medicine, except for when it's dead, it's dead, it's black and white. But otherwise, there, we need to tailor, we need to personalize interventions. The FDA at one point approved lots of drugs that, that were part of this addiction cycle. Now there are companies trying to create op opioids that are less addictive or non-addictive uh, or, or different, and the FDA is, and the advisory boards are turning them all down. Do you have confidence that there's a path forward? Are, are, are opioids done uh, as a pain response, or, or do you think that there are pathways to kind of get the modulation right at some point? I do think that there are pathways to get the modulation right. And I don't think uh, opioids are gone. I mean, to start with, mm -hmm. anesthesiologists rely enormously on opioids, and they are extraordinary. So again, it's like they are one, one product, in this case a medicine, can have very good properties, really life-saving properties, and also can be horrifically addicted and lead to overdose. So the issue is how to understand how to properly use it, mm -hmm. and how to generate policy that protects the public. 
I think when we look at the uh, opioid epidemic, of course, we say, okay, we overprescribe opioid medications. But there were multiple layers that led us to overprescribe um, opioid medications. And one of them was we created a structural system that was promoting it. You could uh, prescribe one month of medications for someone with moderate pain that needed it for three days, and the insurance will pay. So we had created that system. So it was the educational system, the insurance systems, and then some very aggressive practices from pharmaceutical industry that we allowed the, that them to do. So it's not like they were outside of a, of a context or a culture. So uh, to me, I, I, we need to be honest with ourselves because if we just want to be okay, okay and non-transparent, um, if we're not transparent, we won't be able to avoid falling into the same mistakes. And that's why it's not that I'm here to, I mean, I'd like to point fingers, not at all. I think that a lot of people had good intentions and without proper knowledge, and there was no follow up, and there were not way to evaluate the consequences, and then we end up where we are. Do we have the resources to deal with this at the level we, we need? Uh, we have two members of Congress, a Republican and Democrat, that will be up here shortly. I always wonder about the literacy of members of Congress on these issues, and particularly in areas of mental health and looking at uh, addiction and, and how you deal, th deal with this as a disease as opposed to you know, a moral judgment. I'm, I'm interested, because you interact with these folks, and in part you're funded by these folks, do you think we have what we need to, to deal with response? I, I definitely interact with them, and, and what I can tell you is that as part of the opioid crisis, there has been for the first time a very significant increase in the resources that we have to advance the science of addiction, mm. and which has always been there, but the opioid crisis has brought it to the fore. Now, the level of understanding, of course, varies enormously, but I can tell you that it has been some of the congressmen that had stood up and with courage before anyone was paying attention. Hal Rogers is a perfect example that stood up and says, and he's come from Kentucky and he was seeing the consequences in his constituents and he stood up and generated this movement on the prescription summit that now serves as an example about how to bring together academicians, lawyers, industry in ways that is not about bickering about one another, but to try to come up with a, a common solution and to work together. So I, I, I mean, it varies a lot, but I think that the tragedy of what we're living has brought us together in ways that it hadn't happened for addiction in the past. What drove you to become so interested in addiction? Well, I think that, again, when we make these sex explanations ourselves, what is it that drives us to, to a part, what we end up doing? And in my case, I think that there's more than one answer. And one of them is I've always been fascinated by the brain. I mean, to mm -hmm. me, it's the most extraordinary thing and of, of, of everything. Um, what is it that makes us human? So I wanted to understand how, why is it that we feel? How is it that we form strong relationships? How is it, why do we need to be with one another? Why are social interaction so important, and medicine was a great way for me to do that, so I enter it there. Now, with respect to medicine, I also have in my family a history of addiction on my mother's side. My, her father, um, my, my grandfather, was an alcoholic, and her brother, my favorite uncle, was an alcoholic. And to me, first of all, I didn't know my grandfather was an alcoholic, nor did I know that he committed suicide because of it until very late when my mother herself was dying. So, that notion that it was so stigmatized that my mother couldn't even tell me about it when she knew that I was fighting for it. And while growing up, I loved my uncle, generous man, charismatic, incredible, incredible person, and yet nobody spoke of him, and they said they had a dark side to him, and, and there was this shame in the family, we couldn't speak about it. So that, that notion of the inability to see that there is, this person is a whole person, and yet there's something that leads him or her to change their behavior. That, right. to me, was what actually, how can we help that individual? And in medical school, I mean, people that were addicted to drugs were completely ignored in psychiatry, which when I went to the residency, I have a patient that was depressed with alcoholism. And the, and, the, and the staff attending will say, Nora, don't worry about the alcoholism, treat the depression. And when he's out, 
he will deal with the alcoholism. Well, if you don't deal with the alcoholism, the patient will not be able to resolve their depression. And that's, that, again, that's dissonance. And then the concept that we were taking people addicted and putting them in prison and jail, antithetical to what you do with someone suffering from a disease, all of that is what led me to do what I do. Well, in reading, I'm going to share a little bit. I mean, you come from a, a, a famous family of shock. So your great-grandfather was Leon Trotsky. Your grandfather, his son, this, this, this issue. So you had people in your family. Just, and it occurred to me in visiting Baltimore the other day to a district uh, right next to another district where there's a 20-year difference in life expectancy. And so when you look at dependency, addiction, everyone has a kind of family situation a little bit like you came in, a, in, a, in, in perhaps a less... Uh, uh, you know, with, with, a, with a, a you know less famous grandfather, great grandfather, and and I'm interested in the fact that something you saw an insight into in your own family with people there is something that might help those those folks in Baltimore or any district that is uh, suffering from this kind of thing. And I'm just wondering what lessons we can drive. And I'm just wondering if it is the uh, issue of embracing people or or whether the you know part of it is medicine and part of it I think is 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 social embrace, right? Totally, and I think that that's what I was going to actually um, mention. It's the social embrace, and I, I've been basically inspired by people that have stood up and, and spoken about addiction themselves with an enormous mm -hmm. amount of courage in an environment that was unclear that it will be acceptable, and that has inspired me too. Mm -hmm. So I would not for many years speak about my own family history of addiction um, until I saw others do it. Mm -hmm. and. And, I, and that basically made me aware that having the courage to speak up is in many ways fundamental to start to break the stigma and the silence. Because if we don't speak about it, it's like it doesn't exist. So nobody's accountable. So is this going to be a good story? I don't want to go to all of you in just a moment for questions. But I noticed in France that France has made it much easier uh, to use medically assisted therapies, if I'm using the correct term. Uh, to respond to opioids. My, uh, uh, someone I know, Lena Wen, when she was head of the um, uh, Baltimore Health Commission, was someone who wrote a blanket prescription for essentially everyone who suffered uh, with these issues and kind of approached that in kind of a complete uh, open way. And when you look at France, there was a 79 percent decline uh, in opioid deaths, right? So is this eventually going to be a good story in America? I, I think that France puts a beautiful example about the notion that if you are able to provide treatment with no judgment and available and accessible and sustained, then you can dramatically reduce overdoses. I mean, mm. here we have it. I mean, we, we need to learn from history, and uh, you have a perfect example. And I always, I like to point on, on how the success that France had in reversing the overdoses by that relatively straightforward intervention. I mean, it's obviously more complex, but provide the treatment. I mean, we have a healthcare system that is amazing. So why can't we not provide these treatments? Is there anything you would move the needle on in terms of in the field of treatment? I'm about to go to BK McDonough. BK, where are you? Just hold on right there. I'm going to give her the first question. That, that can help us understand what's going on in the front line. So I know you're a scientist. I know you're developing therapies. You're looking. I want you to talk to the front line people and hear, you know, have that exchange for a moment. What can we do to kind of improve the triangle of support, if you will, from those that are dealing with this in the front line? Well, one of the aspects that I, again, you learn by making mistakes, and I came to realize that for many years, I basically felt that through the science and through my own experiences, I have a sense about what addiction was. And then I realized that that, that is very simplistic and how important it is to bring the patient voices, the families, into actually uh, being voices in what should be priorities on our scientific endeavors. So we, we think, I mean, OK, we, I'm the physician. I know what's best for the, the patient. It's not. The patient knows what they need. So, being able to bring the, the patients forward has been something that I learned later that I should have, but I learned it. So, <laughs> I wanted to uh, let's bring the mic to BK. BK, I'm going to give you an opportunity for a question or a comment because I want to include the view of those folks that are running centers that are out there dealing uh, with people out there. What what this room should know about that uh, experience and challenge? 
Hi, everyone. My name is BK McDonough with Karen Treatment Centers. Um, and thank you so much for putting this on. And, and it's great to see you again, Dr. Volkov. Um, we're very fortunate uh, at Karen Treatment Centers to actually do some work with NIDA um, and have some collaboration and some research. Um, there are a number of challenges in bringing the family members. And I think you hit it right on the head there, Steve, that you know, the ones that are closest to us are the ones that are the most damaged in the process of addiction. Um, it is incredibly important to have those family members be present and to also learn. It's not just about educating the, the legislators about policy as far as addiction goes and substance use disorders, but educating the family members as well. I think family members really struggle to see sometimes their own need for recovery, their own individual need for their recovery in this disease. Uh, and it's just, without that, we have a treatment center where you, you might take a, a tree that is dying in, in the soil here and bring it to a place where it gets all the nutrients and the light right. and the water that it needs. But if it goes back into the same soil, and this is where the social supports are so important and those recovery supports and that sense of community, if you put it back into that very same soil, what's going to change? So taking a look at the, the longer term needs and really looking at addiction as a chronic illness. How many years have you been at this? It feels like a lifetime. <laughs> you, I've, I've been in the are field you optimistic? for. You know what? I'm surrounded by miracles every day. Oh, I am. You know, and, and it is. It's not easy. But the solutions are there. You know, they say in, in recovery, it, it's uh, simple, but it's not easy. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Other question? Yes, right, right here. Oh. We'll throw the mic over to oh. you. We have lots of folks watching online. And tell um. us who you are. Sure. Christine Saab, I'm a pediatrician here in Rockville, Maryland. Thank you so much for putting this on. Um, I agree we need to focus on the opioid abuse that's going on. My concern on the forefront is the amount of anxiety and depression I'm seeing in the adolescents that are coming through right. um, and the substance use on marijuana and these dispensaries that are opening up. Um, and that leads to my concern about benzodiazepine use. So I think it's addiction, it's a big, it's a disease. And my concern is certainly we need to deal with the opioid epidemic, but let's not keep our eyes closed to the other things that are coming up our path, because right. we're so focused on this. So I think just sort of broadening what we're dealing with. But Nora, thank you very much. We'll give you the last word. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And that's why I say we need to face the question, what is making us so very vulnerable? That because if it's not opioids, it's going to be stimulants. And if it's not, we're also facing an increase in the use of marijuana and people becoming addicted to it. And, and these are not problems that we can just go solve one at a time. My per perspective is how do we provide a resilience to people so that they don't uh, get into taking drugs and then becoming addicted. I do believe that at the essence, uh, we have a very powerful tool in our hands. One of them is, of course, science help us. But if science is not utilized, then it serves no purpose. And that we need to focus, too, in models that can provide a social support system that we require to provide resilience, prevent addiction. And for those that have addiction, allow them to recover. I just want to say thank you for your scientific mind and your passion in this issue. Nora Volkoff, Director, thanks. National Institute of Drug Abuse. Steve, thank thanks you so a lot. Much. Thanks thank very you. much. Thanks.